disruption, disturbance, or problems which interrupt an event, activity, or process. Endocrine system, composed of endocrine glands which secrete hormones into interstitial fluid that then diffuse into the blood. Examples, pituitary, thyroid, parathyroid, and adrenal glands. Pancreas, ovaries, kidneys, stomach, liver, small intestine, skin, heart, adipose tissue, and placenta. The study of the endocrine system is called endocrinology. To be honest, it boggles my mind. It encompasses so many endocrine glands as well as organs and has such a far-reaching total body capacity that personally, I perceive endocrine disrupting chemicals to be one of the biggest threats to our health. Welcome back to Green Beauty Intel. My name's Marie. Today we are talking endocrine disrupting chemicals. I'm gonna go ahead and give you the three takeaways right up here at the front. The first one is that the endocrine system is complicated and responsible for many things that make our body function properly. Number two, endocrine disruptors are rampant and exist in more than just topical products. So even if you wanted to get away from them, you probably can't. Number three, the research on whether or not these chemicals are ever going to be removed from our life or our environment um, is still pretty inconclusive. So there you go. That's the point of this video. Does it sound biased? I don't think so. Uh, let's jump in. Let's start this video with a look to an article from the Journal of Endocrinology. Exposure to endocrine disruptors during adulthood. Consequences for female fertility. From this article, we can define endocrine disrupting chemicals as chemicals that exhibit endocrine disrupting functions in both humans and animals. This article gives us a great framework for the diverse exposure that we receive in all areas from endocrine disrupting chemicals. So let's look at some of the categories of where these things are existing. First up, pesticides. This can be things like insecticides, fungicides, herbicides. Next one, heavy metal. Cigarettes, alcoholic drinks, dietary supplements, and contaminated food, air, and water. So that goes back to my point number three I wanted to make as this takeaway video is that even if you wanted to get away from these things right now, I don't think that you can. Now, plasticizer alternatives. Now, most consumers are rejecting phthalates and BPA. However, as those chemicals are moved out of, you know, out of the trend, they are supplementing those or using other types of chemicals in that class that haven't been studied and just putting them back into the market. So you're gonna find those things in flexible plastics. Now, here's one that I can't pronounce. Um, it also goes by NP. It's commonly used in pesticides, lubricating oils, laundry or dishwashing detergents. Because of the widespread use of NP, it is present in soil and sediments, groundwater and surface water, food and bottled water. Recently, I did a video on laundry soap. And why is that? Because of the more and more research I do about topical products, the more I'm not really worried about topically what I'm putting on my body and I'm more worried about what we're washing down the drain that's contaminating our land and air and water. So, like I said, I did laundry detergent and dishwashing detergent is on the list. I'm testing some now for a showdown for dishwashing soaps. Here's another one. Triclosan. It's an antibacterial agent that's been used in the United States for 40 plus years. It's in soaps, it's in toothpastes. And if you want to get a little retro Marie and, and the color green, um, I did a video about Triclosan in 2016. It was actually one of my first really in-depth videos. So on September 2nd, like I said, the FDA banned 19 chemicals, including the chemical Triclosan from antibacterial soap. I'll link it below. Parabens, now there's a hot topic. They are antimicrobial preservatives. They are used in cosmetic products and food, but you know they actually exist as well in indoor dust. Who knew? Now, 
Let's rewind a little bit and go back to how the endocrine system works. Endocrine glands secrete hormones that make their way to the bloodstream. Hormones are a mediator molecule that is released in one part of the body but regulates activity of cells in other parts of the body. They leave their endocrine glands and they have a target. And at their target cell is a docking station called a receptor. For example, thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH travels to the thyroid. Should it get lost on the way and end up at the ovaries, it will have no impact because the ovaries do not have thyroid stimulating hormone receptors for it to dock to. Something else important to note about hormones is that there are lipid soluble hormones and water soluble hormones and they behave very differently when they reach their target cell. Lipid soluble hormones actually are able to penetrate inside the cell and work their magic, usually producing an enzyme. Water soluble hormones have a much more complicated and interesting way that they work by attaching to the outside of the plasma of the cell and causing a chain reaction. Usually what they're hoping to produce are protein kinases. Do you start to see how I've only told you three or four things about how the endocrine system works, but that it's so freaking complicated? Yes, yes it is. So things to remember are that part of the way that hormones work is that they work with receptors and they produce enzymes and proteins that actually do things and function in the body. Don't cry, I'm done with the technical stuff. I only mention it to illustrate that when you talk about disrupting the endocrine system, there's more than just one way to do it. Now, since we talk about beauty products, let's look at one class of endocrine disrupting chemicals called parabens. Now, I'm not going to try to convince you for or against parabens. We will use them as an example class of chemicals to which we can make inferences about the other classes of chemicals, i.e. the endocrine system is complex and the study and impacts of endocrine disruptors are even more complex. Now we know that parabens are used in food and cosmetic products. Let's look at this article from the Journal of Molecular Science because it really in one article encompasses a lot of the things that I want to highlight about endocrine disrupting chemicals. First of all, for parabens specifically, it gives us a history. In 2004, Darbre et al. published a study that said that parabens were found in breast cancer tissue. The study was proven to have many flaws. If you want to read the EU's official response to that, I've linked it below. Go check it out. Um, however, this study really began the conversation that still exists today that parabens exert concerning estrogenic effects. Let's keep going. The article explains how estrogen works. Estrogens are primary female sex hormones playing a central role in a variety of physiological actions in females and males. Estrogens trigger target gene expression mainly by acting through estrogen receptors. Do you remember what we talked about? Hormones are able to enact their, their processes by receptors, by binding onto receptors. Also from this article, it talks to us about how parabens penetrate our body. We know they get in. They have a smaller molecular weight. They get in the body and that is established. So parabens can enter the systemic circulation via oral intake or by transdermal penetration. So this study was able to give us a history of where the questions arose about parabens. And to this date, from 2004 to 2019, studies are still being done about parabens and this exact same topic that they exert concerning estrogenic effects. Now, what's interesting about this article is that they mentioned several other ways parabens are being studied and how they may affect the endocrine system. So number one, they mentioned that most of the studies addressing inferences of parabens with estrogen hormone action focus on the estrogen receptors, okay? So they're saying that a lot of studies have been done about estrogen receptors. Number two, the type of things that they're studying in this particular study are the enzymes that either 
um, make more active and potent this estrogen or turn off the estrogen. They also mentioned that parabens, when they're um, ingested into the body or when they're um, absorbed into the body, create what's called a metabolite or a byproduct. Um, and that this byproduct can be sh has shown to be slightly estrogenic. Number four, they were shown to inhibit another enzyme called this. In human epidermal keratinocytes and skin fractions and therefore block local estrogen congregation and inactivation. Now, like we said, parabens are a hot topic. They've been studied extensively since 2004. Some people still believe that there are questions that are, have not been answered, which is why research is still going on to this day about how they interact in the body. And so I think the last takeaway of this video is that we can't escape these endocrine disrupting chemicals, even if we want to. Um, we can only as consumers keep choosing to purchase things that don't contain them. So even though cosmetic chemists laugh at the green beauty movement and say there's no reason that we shouldn't be using parabens as a preservative, we as the consumer are saying we have still seeds of doubt. You haven't proven it to us that, there's, that they're safe. And we, the consumer, are effectively booting parabens out of the market. So what happens when we apply that consciousness to everything? Um, to flexible plastics, why are we even still using those? Um, to, to more heavy regulation about heavy metals in our drinking water, um, to more and more pressure on places like Monsanto to stop killing us with their toxins. This is a long video, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, feel free to call me out on anything that you don't agree with and I'll see you next week, bye.